a scratching at the door. It is my cathedral, my magnum opus, the culmination of two decades spent grinding my way through the most debauched and blasphemous practices and indulgences, a thing of imposing grandeur most might shrug off as ominous or distasteful, like a Soviet-era state edifice or a moldering abandoned hospital on an overcast hillside. It's also seedy, just the right mix of ordered and disordered to tickle my mind and draw me into the rapturous atmosphere I have worked so hard to create within its walls. For years, I have retreated here when the weight of the world around me has beaten me low with its tedious, mundane goings-on, a last respite for a mind that never felt quite at home there. Fitting, then, that it will serve as my tomb. Whoever stumbles across this account will find it in my home. From there, my cathedral is some two miles away, down the old logging trail that forks off from Whispering Pines Road. The dugout is near its terminus, a low, brooding, bunker-like structure buried in the hills and blocked by a pair of rusted metal doors. I will leave these locked but accessible via the key beneath this letter. I don't have any idea as to what the purpose of the modest dugout was originally, for it was barren when I found it two decades ago. Perhaps storage, for the nearest house is much too far away for it to serve effectively as a storm shelter. Regardless, the contents will be unharmed. I have committed crimes to attain the totems and relics I surround myself with, but while I might be a thief, I have always considered myself a borrower of items rather than a taker of treasures. They may be redistributed to the proper places as authorities see fit to distribute them. Whoever first goes to the cathedral should mentally steel themselves for what they'll find when they push through those heavy doors, though. The collection began when I was a teenager. The first modest additions were items I acquired while delving in abandoned places of ill repute close to my hometown. I took a century-old diary from a moldering manor home in Louisville, and snagged a small bust dulled by time from a tottering school's library in Lynch. As I grew in boldness, my taste for eerie and unsettling items grew more and more insatiable. The gravestones of several notable Civil War-era dead were taken from Perryville, beginning the collection of headstones and memorial plaques of supposedly spectral figures that tile my cathedral's walls. A bone saw, taken from a reportedly haunted hospital across the state line in Ironton, leans on a shelf against the skull of a folklore-rumored hermit-turned-warlock from the hills west of Ashland which I dug up and preserved with great care after his remains had lurked in the ground for the better part of a century. International connections may be needed to return some of the items, for I have done a fair bit of traveling in my time, always on the lookout for suitably evocative items for the gallery. The collection boasts, for example, a golden ring pulled from the bottom of a Yucatan cenote, where it rested among the honored sacrificial dead piled there during the golden age of the Maya. It rests upon the index finger of an unnaturally large mummified hand treasured by a twisted group of scholarly mountainside cultists in Tibet, who believed it to be the withered claw of a woman from the fabled subterranean realm of Patala. All this shall be catalogued in the most intimate detail which my memory allows, and I will denote the dates and locations at which each item was acquired, from the most modest small-town tombstone to the most exotic cursed statuette or storied murder weapon. I won't get too bogged down in all that here, though. At least, no more so than I already have. You will find that list in the cathedral, along with whatever remains of me. The purpose of this text is to dissuade anyone from touching or tampering with, in any way, a certain item I've hidden away in a long-forgotten mine not terribly far from here. The entrance will be collapsed, a feat which will charge me no small amount of work, and it desperately needs to stay that way. I only bother to mention this item at all because, for reasons that will become evident, I am unsure whether it will stay put down there in the wake of my death. 
Any perusing these pages would be justified in wondering what all the fuss is about, so I'll lay out the story as clearly as I'm able, starting with why I even had cause to come in contact with the wretched thing in the first place. Some years into my darker explorations and trophy-taking, exploiting a long interest in the darker side of paranormal speculation and occult practices, I began to experiment here and there with immersing myself in the kinds of provocative groups that often congregated around the places I visited. In college, I frequented a local quarry notorious for suicidal leaps with some of my fellow students on Halloween for a very stereotypical, drunk layman's seance. It produced nothing tangible in terms of unexplainable experiences, but electrified me with the mood, the atmosphere, that accompanied our silly ritual when it was being performed in so ominous a setting. Branching out from there, I found equally atmospheric experiences by hitching my wagon to various occult groups across my region, the most long-standing relation being with a nameless group of pagan revivalists in Cave City. They stoked my need for taboo moods with spectacular solstice sacrifices of live bullocks during firelight ceremonies in the cave systems across the county. Over the years, I built up a book of contacts who shared my fascination, or at least held a belief in eldritch ritual and ample enough contacts to put me in a position to experience and partake in their rites. I never developed any belief that anything I was doing had any impact in the material sense, however. Chasing these rituals and gatherings was, to me, purely a folkloric, atmospheric exercise, a passionate and exciting interest that sweetened my existence in a world I found comparatively drab. When I witnessed a group of isolated townspeople in the arid interior of Tunisia burn a live lamb on a bed of coals before an ancient horned statue in the hills beneath a full moon, I was under no illusions that I had made contact with Baal Haman. Rather, I could imagine for the briefest hour that I stood in Carthage before the fall. I could feel the exaltations and excesses of the men and women of that lost land in a way that few others, even amongst our great but fast decaying scholarly institutions, will ever know. In this way, I liked to pretend that my pursuits were entirely anthropological in nature, an extended study in the collection and interpretation of dark folklore. There was a small, sequestered portion of my mind, however, that had less rational motivations. Whenever a promising message would come my way, titillating me at the thought of potential reality behind all the shadowy pageantry of these ritual outings, I would jump at the chance to experience the kind of raw emotion, fear, awe, or otherwise, that was so often whispered about in occult gatherings. I wanted some taste of the beyond whatever that happened to be, and a chance discovery I made in July seemed to promise that very thing. It was this call to the unknown that set me upon the path towards my final resting place in the cathedral. Several months ago, a contact I made years back while visiting radical underground pagan organizations in Europe and with whom I had shared deep if infrequent correspondence, was mentioned in passing by a mutual acquaintance and it came up that he hadn't been heard from in some months. I wrote to him, and when calls and emails went unanswered, I resolved to make the trip east to his home in the mountains of western Maryland to see him in person. Even among circles as prone to weirdness and reclusiveness as mine, it was odd for someone to go entirely dark. The nature of my interests, and those of my friend for that matter, meant that hunger for understanding ears to speak to was endless. For someone to wholly disconnect from the people who were best able to understand his eldritch obsessions and habits was an act of self-isolation above and beyond anything I, or most I inquired with, had ever witnessed. When I arrived at his modest home west of Cumberland, I found it deserted in an odd state, with the front door unlocked and unsecure but the windows boarded up as if a hurricane were soon due on the mountain. His shotgun lay tossed on the couch in the front room as I entered the building, and by the looks of the place, he had been holed up there for some time, sequestered off from the rest of the house. The doorway to the basement was boarded up, as was his adjoining bedroom and the back door onto the porch, 
which left only the front door accessible, and even that seemed to have been secured until recently. With his front sitting room space and a combined kitchen cut off like that, he'd set himself up to sleep on his couch and over the intervening days built up a fearful mess of discarded food and hastily rifled books and papers. Upon forcing my way into the basement, I found the sparse furniture and stored books and pictures tossed and turned, but nothing missing. The shotgun resting in the front room above had been fired several times into the walls, but it had apparently stricken nothing, for there was no trace of blood or injury to be discovered. Such disorder was worrying, for he had been an orderly and reserved man. What worried me more, however, was that there were no signs of forced entry, and that his old truck still sat rusting in the gravel driveway, the keys tucked under his driver's seat as was his custom. The boarding and locks holding shut the front door had been calmly removed and unlatched from within, and there was not a single sign of disturbance in his makeshift fortress that would suggest someone had laid siege to the house to take him or his belongings. After locking himself in his front room for days, perhaps weeks, he had finally freed himself and walked out into the dense, mountainous woodland surrounding the house with no gun, no shoes, no keys, and no truck. I set about investigating myself, hesitant to involve the authorities for obvious reasons. It was one thing to call up mutual associates to check whether there was any consensus on what he had been up to in the days prior to his confinement, but it was quite another to allow police to intrude on his property and potentially discover some macabre collection similar to my own that I had been unaware of. Call after call came back inconclusive and shrouded in uncertainty leaving me less and less convinced as the evening wore on that he would simply stumble out of the darkening woodline any minute, fresh off some spectacular hallucinogenic trip, angry at my intrusion into his home. Then, as the sun dipped below the hunched, wood-cloaked mountains, my friend's ancient landline received a call, sending me stumbling inside at a run from the porch and plunging me into roiling chaos. The initial exchange seemed innocuous enough, considering what was to follow. Speaking accented but practiced English, a man asked after the whereabouts of my friend. I was initially hesitant to be fully forthright with this stranger, but when he voluntarily betrayed that my friend had been in Myanmar by asking how he had been since his return, I felt it was necessary to probe just a little. I asked when my friend had departed and upon realizing his return to the States must have been immediately followed by his recent descent into paranoid compound fortification. I inquired whether he had seemed distressed or ill in the days leading up to his return home. Those simple questions were somehow all the man on the other end of the line needed to hear, for his response was to ask if he had gone missing. I warned him, the voice muttered. I warned him not to go up into the mountains. I knew it must be bad for him to stay so quiet after leaving. The exchange that followed could not have totaled more than ten minutes, but my constant reflection on it over the intervening weeks has stretched it into an hours-long ordeal, remembered verbatim and retrievable down to a syllable. At my insistence, he told me something of the witching circles he occupied in Yangon, and of my friend's keen interest in them. As evasive as was I with exact details, he described a trip through the country organized for my friend by contacts in the region, a sort of whirlwind tour of debauched and culturally subterranean experiences, which had apparently terminated in an ill-advised trip into the mountainous north of the country that the speaker and his local Yangon brethren had absolutely refused to attend. There are ruins in the hills, he told me, the disgust plain in his voice, sacked and toppled by the Bagan, and with good reason. None should travel there. For centuries, people both local to the region and native to other provinces of Burma had steered clear of the place. The long-standing curse placed upon it by the Bagan kings of old, bolstered here and there by the hushed retelling of another tale of woe, sparked when some foreign traveler or urban youth from the south insisted on seeing the forbidden place reiterated in the flesh of modernity just as it would have been recited those centuries ago from atop the peacock throne of Burma. The man warned me with hushed tones not to look into my friend's last days, to burn any of his private writings, 
and to leave the dead to lie. He then hung up, the whole thing feeling for all the world like an establishing scene out of a century-old horror story. That is precisely what made it impossible for me to heed his warnings. Even as I looked over the domestic devastation around me left in the aftermath of just such a visit, I understood every ounce of thought that had driven my friend to make the trip into the mountains. These unnamed ruins, haunted by shadowy legendary so fierce an occultist guide among fellow occultists would not risk their ancient paths, were everything a chaser of the extravagant could dream to see. Initially worried for my friend, the realization that it had grown dark outside now breathed some level of fear into me, only heightening the racing of my mind. Had he not boarded up his home and thrashed and shot at some unknown force in the basement, only to run away into the woods? What, should I decide to stay here through the night, would I find? These were the sorts of thoughts that would have driven a reasonable man out of the house and down the little mountain road into the security of town. But I, as attested to by the stolen gravestones and human remains which shall soon surround my corpse in the cathedral, am not a reasonable man. I set about a fevered examination of the books and notes with which my friend had occupied himself during his voluntary imprisonment, and left messages with all the contacts I had garnered over a lifetime's probing the obscure and obscene who I thought might have any knowledge of use to me. After all, with nothing else to work from, this scrap of tantalizing information was the only hope of learning what befell my companion and discovering whether the unknown caller's pessimism on that score was justified. The ominous connotations of that information were just an added incentive. The night was a long, tedious affair, with several breaks taken for no better reason than to calm my nerves and assure myself there was nothing lurking in the unlit kitchen or creeping up the now-exposed basement staircase. Nothing save the atmosphere of the little house was amiss, though, and the night ultimately proved enlightening. From a battered notebook well-worn by continued visits from its owner over the years, I learned about my friend's obsession with the concept of the knot, a kind of mythic Burmese Buddhist spirit or deity. Writing using a cipher popularized by the Golden Dawn with which many in my circles will be familiar, he had been jotting down notes regarding the origination of the currently recognized pantheon of 37 knot and on unofficial, more local knot revered or feared by populations of certain towns and villages spread here and there across the interior of Myanmar. It was a history in which I was not versed, for Myanmar had never come up as a focal point of occult or otherwise weird significance. But he had developed a fascination with rumors of a cult in the remote north of the country centered on a knot of such wickedness it had single-handedly spurred the attempted banning of local knot offerings and the institution of the official pantheon of 37, instituted some thousand years ago, after the end of the first millennium. Scattered across the margins of Cambridge and Oxford histories of Southeast Asia and several more journals filled with scribbled code, I learned the story of King Anahrata, founder of the first unified Burmese empire, and a figure seemingly obsessed with the imposition of Buddhist religious order over top the native faiths of his land. In the texts of academia, the reasons given for this ranged from expanding state control and authority over local governance to enriching the crown through more reliable religious taxation. But notes from my friend on correspondence with local occultists in their own books of speculative history painted a different, altogether darker picture. Folk tales from the jungle-choked Kachin Hills in the north of the country joined long-standing occult traditions in laying the blame for this crackdown on local rituals at the feet of a reviled figure called Paungku, whose name is closely linked to the modern Burmese word for spider. Paungku, known by no other name or title, is shadowed by many rumored pasts and motives with some tales alleging he was a noble member of a local clan whose prosperity was shattered by the expansion of the king's empire in the south, turning he and his family to blood offerings and shadowy rites in hopes of bettering their fortunes. Still others believe he was a not-possessed vagrant, a nobody raised from nothing by a wicked spirit to great infamy only to just as quickly be tossed aside 
an expendable mortal shell for a being which had long lurked in the mountains. Many more hinted origins exist, but the outcome of the rise of Paunku is always the same, with the mundane man-turned warlock leading a cult of several hundred followers into a megalithic ruined city tucked away in the trees, where they began to prey on the surrounding countryside. Village youths started to go missing, and over time, whole rural communities were stripped clean of inhabitants. Rippling outwards from the ruined city, the locals spoke in hushed whispers of a creeping death, a diabolical knot or witch in the guise of a monster, who haunted the spaces beneath raised houses and huts at night, and whose disgusting visage appeared to the locals in nightmare night after sleepless night. So great was the fear brought about by this shadowy plague of disappearances that the regional seat of power, the small city of Mogaung, was forced to take notice. Its kingly high priest, himself a vassal and ally of the powerful king Anarata in the south, sent men into the region to quell the disorder and bring those responsible to justice. When those men, too, had gone missing, an army of several hundred was raised, and when that had failed to report back, the priest sent desperate word to Pagan, urging the king for aid. Anarata, occupied with other matters in the south, failed to answer with speed, but was finally spurred to action by a dark event sometime in the middle of 1057, when a nighttime raid on the outskirts of Mogaung itself drove the priest to flee south to the capital, where he took up exiled residence in Pagan with his suzerain. This attack which was laid at the feet of bandits in official records, did not topple the city or level any temples, but its nature was so horrid that Anahrata put a momentary halt to his campaigns of unification and consolidation to march north with more than 5,000 men, riding upon a gold-girdled war elephant and leading the host in person. The events which followed seem singularly terrible and the narrative presented in the royal chronicle of Pagan of a bandit revolt quashed by the glorious armies of Anahrata does little to explain why all but a thousand of the men sent into the jungle never came back, or why local Kachin legend speaks of the mortified screams which echoed down from the hills being audible even now on certain moonlit nights when the skies are right. Bandits, after all, could not have spurred a burgeoning kingdom with more enemies than allies to spend half a year leveling an ancient stone city, and the rest of the century burying its name and history by burning books and sundering stone carvings. The sun rose over the Maryland hills, and with it I found myself reverberating with not only a new grasp of a strange land's lore and legendary, but of my aims moving forward. Several contacts of my friends had agreed to come search for him and continue looking into the mounds of documentation he had compiled. While they got on the road and began their long drives, a Javanese associate who had led me on an extravagant tour of ancient fire cults still in practice upon the slopes of remote volcanoes of that island contacted a friend at my behest who initiated a chain of further connections from friend to friend to friend until I was speaking with a Burmese Buddhist monk turned animist wise man who knew of the rumored city in the north. Though he dissuaded me from my stated aim of visiting the site in search of answers, he agreed to meet me in Yangon upon my arrival and place me in contact with locals of the northern Kachin province who could aid me in getting transport and supplies in so remote a region. I purchased my tickets that morning for a chain of flights leaving out of Washington, D.C. that evening, and after leaving a scribbled note for my vanished friend in the off chance he resurfaced before his other companions arrived, I piled into my car without a wink of sleep to drive for the capital. I cannot entirely give voice to the feelings which drove my movements throughout the day. Exhaustion didn't catch up with me until well into the initial flight from Washington to Japan, and even then, Sleep came in fitful bursts. I was too busy poring over hastily copied scraps of information left by my friend, staring holes in satellite images of northern Myanmar, and memorizing a few helpful words of the Burmese language to even consider how I felt. The whole of the scenario seemed like some great initial stage in an epic drama or thriller, and my worry at the sudden disappearance of a close friend and associate in the pursuit of strangeness 
had fast been molded together with an urge to see what he must have seen, and to feel whatever had spurred the paranoia he must have felt during those last manic days in the closed front room. It would be trite of me to proclaim now what a fool I was for being so blind, so eager to face the unknown. Moreover, it wouldn't be entirely honest. Even now, as I prepare to do what must be done, I can recognize that what I found in Myanmar was exactly the sort of thing I had been searching for throughout the long and confused span of years that led me into the jungles of rural Kachin, and I can't claim I regret taking the journey. I can only regret that my friend had to suffer what he did to show me the path, and that both he and I proved too fragile to tolerate the thing which followed us home. I met with my contact after a lengthy but fitful sleep at the cheapest hotel I could book once landed and settled in Yangon. After another lengthy attempt to dissuade me from my course outside a tiny local cafe which featured florid stories about regional Kachin Independence Army rebels, he sketched out a travel itinerary which would take me first by bus, then by locally arranged jeep up precarious roads and paths to the tiny settlement of Sumprabum in the farthest northern reaches of the nation. The way was precarious at times, with the aged dirt roads never failing to buck and rock the buses this way and that along the scrub-choked cliff faces they hugged. The locals, bundled in like canned fish with a painfully conspicuous foreigner among them, mostly rode in sleepy silence through nearly two days of travel, leaving me to wonder whether I was the only one worried by the idea of toppling over the edge. It would not do, after all, to come so close to the unknown only to die in a bus crash. Worry proved pointless, however, and I ended up in a tiny flea-ridden bunk in Sumprabum a couple days after setting out from Maryland, my eyes scanning the tree-shrouded hills through the mist from my perch on the porch of a Catholic mission as they reluctantly allowed me some much-needed sleep. The first real rest I'd had since prior to my fateful road trip turned world excursion began. It would later prove to be the final mundane, dreamless sleep I would ever experience, but in my exhausted anticipation, I didn't take any time to savor it. Awakening plucked and prodded my mosquitoes, but otherwise feeling prepared for anything, I made my way to a modest logger's house of sheet metal and crude timber where I met my local guide, an older man still steely with a laborer's wiry muscle who the entire gathering of homes called Saya, something close to teacher. With my night owl's pale skin, my relatively impressive height, and my profuse sweating at the unaccustomed humidity, I must have looked like some traveling alien jester to the village's locals, and we'd soon gathered a sizable crowd of onlookers in the village as we talked over the plan for the day's hike. I would pay a small sum to his family for his aid and the food and water he would furnish me with for the night I wanted to spend in the ruins, and then he would lead me on foot about twenty miles to the northwest into the forest, over hills and through valleys, until we arrived at the place the local Kachin population had dubbed Pietsehon. The name was only ever spoken in wavering tones of disgust and fear, and the assigning of so alien a name alongside my newfound proximity to the place my friend had been only a short while ago, filled me with nervous apprehension for the first time since my entry into his home back in the States. While that vestigial reptile brain warning of danger to come was enough to put me on edge, it came nowhere close to drowning out my higher aspirations toward intrigue and awe. To be so very close to the unknown was an ecstasy I hadn't found in all my years of searching, and I was not about to abandon that sensation now. Saya set a firm pace up what initially were muddy and brutally sloped logging roads through the hills. After several hours we branched off and forded into the sea of trees. The undergrowth and tree trunks combined into a morass which looked absolutely identical to my untrained eye for hour after hour, but by nothing more than his memory of the landscape and the feel of the hills beneath his flip-flop clad feet, Saya pressed through, always seeming to know just the place to squeeze through a looming wall of interwoven trees or a jam in fallen stone and logs in a creek. 
Our entire trip was scored by his thickly accented English telling story after story about the sizes of the snakes that could be found here, or the density of the antives choking the ground there, interspersed with assurances that I could turn back at any time with but a word to him if I lost my nerve. I responded and questioned him when I could, but I was winded and broken by the endless ascents and descents we made despite years of avid hiking back home and my spaces between strained breaths were few and far between. He told me of several disappearances of hunters and scouts for logging outfits in the area, but nothing certain had transpired near the ruins in recent memory. So dark was their reputation that throughout the militia-driven guerrilla warfare which had preceded my arrival for several years, not one camp or troop movement had been made around or through Pietzehan whether by loyalist or separatist forces. Saya was the only man in the area that had come close in the past five or six decades, and even he never dared to go the final mile or two toward the old settlement and the trees. The first of these visits was a childhood expedition in search of village chickens spooked into the jungle by a storm, which had ended in him accidentally stumbling across the stream which babbled downhill from the crest upon which Pietzehan brooded and the second was to lead my friend to the stony banks of that very same stream. On arriving, the brave man made me the same offer he'd made my friend, standing with his hands on his hips and offering to come with me into the ruins if I felt I needed him there. It was an offer made through a face haunted by the very syllables formed in making it, and I couldn't bring myself to ask Saya along. Thanking him for his kindness, I made certain of the time I was to meet him tomorrow, and then parted for the legend-haunted wreck atop the low mountain, with afternoon long having set in. Our pace had been slowed by my pondering progress, and I knew the few remaining hours of daylight would provide more than enough time for the savvy Saya to reach the logging roads and be well on his way to the village by nightfall. The prospect of a night alone on this unknown precipice only set in when thirty minutes of hiking up the creek bed had secured my isolation, and I gripped the little revolver I had been given to ward off tigers with a tight desperation I had never before experienced, while my tired legs carried me that last mile into Pietzehon. I was more vibrant and alive in those terrified minutes than I would ever been before. I pity my friend for having been the very first outsider in a century or more to visit the place, had denied him the experience of knowing some specter of danger that lurked there firsthand. While he must have felt the weight of the ruins' reputation and atmosphere, only I knew the fate of a personal friend who had come before. That lit a fire in my stomach so intense I chewed the interior of my cheek raw in jittery anticipation of reaching the summit my wavering legs finding new strength as my destination neared. During my hurried in-flight preparations for this moment, I had scoured pictures, satellite images, and documentary footage of great Burmese temple and stupa sites like Bagan, wanting to be accustomed to the kind of structures I might find on arrival. I had expected crumbling but mighty dome and spire-capped edifices like those, but what I found was altogether alien. The structures of Pietzehan were much more like the small, tightly packed, cone-roofed structures of lesser-known Nyang Ohak far to the south, with the two- or three-foot-wide avenues between the hundreds of huddled monuments infested with hungry plant growth and the few untoppled stone peaks reaching no further than fifteen or twenty feet into the branch-strangled sky. Many of them leaned their bases sinking into the stone of the ground as the passing of ten centuries remolded the very earth beneath their feet. It was the material, though, that shocked me so, making me think I had wandered into some mighty forest of vine-blackened prehistoric teeth as I crested the hill and stumbled into that outpost of blasphemy. The stone was not the reddish-brown of most of Myanmar's monuments, nor the sandy, water-aged brown of monuments elsewhere in the near and far east. It was not the marble of rich classical sculpture, or the placid limestone gray of contemplative New World ziggurats and Old World castles. Rather, it was the shiny and rippling surface of masterfully shaped obsidian, 
with the rain-polished surfaces staring back in rank after rank at me through the trees and scrub, looking for all the world like massive, teeming ant mounds. The play of the sun through the canopy above off the slightly uneven surfaces even lent them the illusion of motion, as of water bubbling in rapids over a bank of piled stones, or, perhaps more appropriately, of millions of chitinous, crawling bodies amassing to repel an intruder. Their mostly conical spires were shingled with tiny interlocking plates of jade, weathered by centuries until it was almost muted, looking gray against the green of the jungle. I lingered there on the precipice for a long while, telling myself I needed to catch my breath, but knowing with every second I spent looking into the distance down those accursed rows that it was something much less explicable that kept my body still among the trees. It's only now, removed from the stress and excitement of the scene, that I can guess what unspoken and unrecognized force halted my progress. Though I might not have been able to give voice to why at the time, I knew deep down that the conditions for obsidian to exist at all were not right here. It was not among the pantheon of materials found in the jewelry, weapons, or art of Southeast Asia, and that was because the nearest region with the right kind of volcanic activity to sport the substance at all was thousands of miles distant across the South China Sea on the island of Papua. I remember vividly having it pointed out as a commodity unique to the isle in my travels through Indonesia years before. What on earth the glistening void dark rock was doing in Myanmar remains far beyond me, but the grooved and layered construction of it, along with the faintly rough and uneven breaks in the glass-like surfaces where it had been so carefully shaped, told me it could be nothing else. When I finally found my legs moving beneath me again, I found winding my way through the obsidian forest testing at each moment my resolution to be there. Each stupa was littered with carvings, almost all of them pictographic, and almost all of these featuring the crouching forms of spiders. The largest, however, dotted every ten or twelve structures along the overgrown path I had chosen to follow, held another, more tantalizingly sinister image. The first time I passed one of these carvings, I kept moving my mind rushing to place why I recoiled on such an instinctive level from those particular figures amidst an army of equally disturbing sights and sensations. Upon reaching a second rendition of the image, though, I opened my pack and flipped through my friend's notebooks, desperate to confirm my suspicions. It didn't take long to find his own rendition of the image, half remembered in my nervous state scrawled on the back cover of a cheap, weathered notebook. The thing was a gaunt, thin, gangly creature, reminiscent of a man, but twisted and bent nearly beyond recognition. Its legs looked almost stick-like, ending in pointed barbs, and its torso sprouted three pairs of arms, evoking the image of sword-wielding Hindu gods. The arms sported one more joint than the single natural elbow showed by human beings, and each pair of them was held high in an awkward exaggerated shrug, like a father aping a silent film-era monster to spook his children, giving me the initial erroneous impression that the many arms were the skeletal structure of unfurled wings. Each came to a blade-like point, just like the feet, with each lower pair slightly shorter than the first. The head, or what should have been a head, was by far the worst of it, and to think of it now in light of what I know makes me wonder beyond wonder that I stayed in that ruin at all. Where a head should be, there was merely an aperture at the top of the torso, a large fang-lined mouth that ran like a zipper from where the back of a neck would have been to where the sternum should begin. Around it, Unfurled and given the illusion of squirming motion by both the impromptu sketch artist and the ancient sculptors, were multiple layers of the sort of stunted forelegs that flank a tarantula's mouth. With the afternoon wearing on, I slowly pierced the shattered remnants of my aesthete's zeal for the unusual back together, as wandering familiarized me with the two square miles or so that constituted the remnants of this little graveyard of forbidden worship. 
the knowledge I gained of its layout fortifying me with a sense of distant belonging I knew full well would disappear as soon as the sun sank beneath the horizon. Radiating inward like the strands of a great web, the avenues of the place all led to a single center point where some larger temple or complex had once stood, and it was here I began to set up a modest little camp to wait out the night piling what scant dry firewood I found and clearing undergrowth so that any insects or snakes would be scared out and away from my position. The old temple was nothing save a foundation long sunk into the murky earth, its bottom lined with mud and stone from the superstructure, leaving only stalagmite-like fragments of its black obsidian walls to poke outward from the debris. It was in the protective shadow of one of these that I settled down, piling several more natural stones as makeshift seats only after I had ensured that none of the images of that damnable spider thing were in view of my perch. The final couple hours before nightfall felt like minutes, for time flew past with the speed only dread can create. I reflected, as I sat waiting for the proper moment to begin burning my small reserve of firewood, that there had been very little in the way of totems or objects among the ruins. Most of the buildings had been stupas, too small to inhabit or enter, and the temple behind me had long ago been toppled in Pagan's raid upon the despised cult. The sculptures, really the only testament to the past nature of this place, were repetitive, mimicking in stonework the kind of mantra repetitions witnessed in Buddhist or animist ceremony. I flipped through my catalogue of hastily acquired knowledge, often referencing my friend's notes in the books to which he'd clung, trying to recall anything which might help me retrace his steps in this dark corner of the earth. I found none, for his notes said nothing of his actual expedition, and the treatments of this place in text and legend were so frightful and vague that there was little to work from. There were no signs of my friend in the avenues of shadowy Pietzeon just as there were no signs of the day-to-day -day lives of its ancient residents. The jungle had swallowed this vile place, and in another millennia, there would likely be nothing left to visit here. Beyond the lack of information on my missing friend, I found my motivation consumed as the sunset got underway by an exhaustion which was entirely unlike me. Thoroughly unnerved and in a place unfamiliar to me, I should have been wide awake ready to weather an entire night of vigilant, guarded listening over my fire. Instead, as the sky's oranges darkened the shadows of the surrounding trees and scrub, turning the ranked stupas into ominous silhouettes which seemed to creep towards me through the encroaching trees, my usual explorer's thrill at the unknown and menacing was extinguished, with each blink coming as a labored exertion while I breathed life into the little woodpile before me. Exacerbating this, I became aware of an impenetrable quiet hanging over the thinned mountaintop clearing in which Pietzehan had brooded all these centuries. It was as if the very mosquitoes in the air and the birds in the trees knew not to disturb the slumber of such an ill-fated and ill-tempered beast as this. Given what has transpired since, I have often reflected on what would have happened had I stayed awake in that ruin. It troubles me to think that, for all of its foreboding menace, I might have spent the rest of my days haunted simply by eerie memory rather than legitimately deadly terrors, but the point is ultimately moot. I might wish I had run out into the trees to spend the night in blind fear beneath the dark cover of the jungle, doing anything in my power to keep myself from sleep, but I did not. Deciding eventually that sleep might well calm my nerves by making me forget the foreboding gloom all around me, I leaned back against the obsidian rise which backed my little chair of stones and nodded off, not fated to witness a single hour of darkness in Pietzehan. I do recall, however, in the way one recalls a memory from distant childhood, a sensation prior to drifting off of hearing whispered syllables of a sing-song tongue foreign to my ears, far off through the stupa rose as my mind gave way to sleep, only audible at their tender volume because of the absolute silence engulfing the place like a fog. Then I awoke. I can think of no better way to communicate it, for that's how it felt. 
One moment I lay prone against the obsidian back of my makeshift chair, and then I was conscious with not a shred of dream or blackened slumber separating me from the night before. The morning light broke through the canopy overhead, and I stood with boots and pack on ankle-deep in the stream which I had climbed to enter Pietsehon the day before. I was physically jolted at the cool moisture of the water seeping into my boots, shifting just enough to startle several birds from perches in the nearby trees. Saya's revolver hung limp in my right hand, and my face lifted uphill towards the barely visible edge of the ruins far up the rise. Before I could even hesitate to gather my wits and plot out what had happened, Saya's voice called out to me, his accented tones drawing my head to the bank, where he stood observing me as a mystified farmer might observe an alien emerged from a UFO crash. He asked if I had heard him, and after a pause I nodded, realizing he must have been trying to capture my attention for a few moments as he approached the water. I shook the moment off, telling him I was very tired from the night in the ruins and rejoicing that he was here at last. I wasted no time in setting off with him down the mountains, furious that my boots were wet as my heels began to viciously blister only a mile or two into the long hike. The whole of the walk was spent trying to remember something, anything, from the night prior, and failing on any count to do so. With no history of sleepwalking, and therefore no prior experiences to compare this to, I concluded that I must have been deep in an exhausted sleep and simply walked myself out of the ruin during the night. What I could not explain was the tying of my shoes and the preparation of my pack, which had been complete right down to the gathering of the notes I carried into watertight plastic bags for the trip through the rain-prone countryside. I also failed to explain the revolver, which seemed to have been prepared for a shot during my forgotten blackout, with the hammer drawn back and ready for firing. Saya, perhaps sensing my internal confusion, did little talking during the whole of our trip back to town, which left me free to attempt in vain to gather my thoughts. The one question I did ask as we stood at dusk beneath a weather-torn awning waiting for the bus was whether he remembered finding my friend in an odd state when he had returned from his night in the ruins. I was told he'd been found clinging to a tree, having climbed ten or so feet up from the ground, with his gun in hand. Exchanging little more than a goodbye, I boarded the night bus and found my threadbare and stained seat, still bewildered by the whole experience. It was then, ensuring my wallet and passport were in order after the strange night in the forest, that I stumbled across the stone, tucked away at the bottom of one of the many pockets on my pack. It was carved in obsidian, smooth beyond all belief, and shaped in crude mockery of a spider, its legs tucked up beneath it and its many eyes picked out in glassy white with paint which, despite the intervening centuries, was still intact. I knew at once that it could not be some forgotten trinket from an earlier trip. Piet Sehon had finally offered up a relic for me in the night, it seemed, some trace of its prior inhabitants. I decided at once that I did not like the thing, and that I would get rid of it in Yangon as soon as I was sure it held no clues pertaining to the night my friend had spent in those trees. Odd as it was for me to be repulsed by something inanimate and unassuming, the simple carving held an old, brooding mood about it that plucked incessantly at my mind. It would not do to keep such a hateful-looking totem close while I tried to forget that fruitless night on the hill and get back to searching for my friend. Oddly enough, I wasn't troubled by exhaustion during the night. The morning found me wide awake for my transfer of buses at a small rural bus terminal and throughout the ensuing day's ride which I attributed to a racing mind plagued by worry. When I arrived late in Yangon that night, I made for my cheap hotel and was glad to get a shower and a warm meal before settling in to make a call to my contact in the city. I asked if he had made any progress in finding the stranger that had attempted to contact my friend during the night I first realized his predicament, but unfortunately, the questions he had put out across Yangon had yielded little. When I questioned him about the figurine, he seemed perturbed to the point of distraction, 
and soon insisted on getting off the line, saying he had other business that night. More unnerved than ever by the figurine, and for some reason put off by the feeling in a way that would have been alien to me in thrill-seeking days prior to this ill-fated visit to Burma, I tossed it from the window into the empty street many stories below, hoping its absence would let me sleep more easily. My flight departed that afternoon, and I knew I needed every wink of sleep I could get to power me through the day-long ordeal of returning home, and the extension of my search for my friend which would follow. I had contacts to pursue who had hopefully been gathering information back home during my absence, and I knew myself too well to believe I would rest soundly once my feet were on American soil and I had searching to do. I cranked up the air conditioning to combat the tropical heat and settled in for the night, the long trip south finally taking its toll on me. That's when I saw it, for the first time. It began like my awakening in the stream, jolted alert with my perception of time suggesting I had only just closed my eyes. I blinked myself awake and I found myself standing in darkness, my back against the cool, hard surface of the wall. My bare feet told me I was atop the bed, but my eyes struggled to make out the shapes of the room, for the light in the bathroom had gone out. Even the bedside clock and the indicator lights on the AC unit had gone dark, leaving me with nothing but the window directly opposite the foot of my bed to guide my way. Something seemed amiss, above and beyond the odd way I had come into consciousness and I only realized what it was as I clambered down from the bed on shaky legs to approach the soft, moonlit glow puncturing the thin curtain masking the window. I slid back the curtain to find that the world outside had gone as black as had my room, with every streetlight or window within view yawning lifeless into the void. Only the moon remained to illuminate the buildings of Yangon which loomed as monolithic concrete obelisks against the deep navy of the horizon, seeming more akin to Stonehenge's dead pillars of rock than bustling apartment or office rises. I told myself that the city had experienced some massive power outage, but fast dismissed that rationalization as I noted the lack of cars, motorbikes, and rickshaws on the streets in the distance. No metropolis ever truly sleeps, and as someone already uncomfortable with the unnaturally cramped press and clamor of the city, to see one so totally vacant was a shock. That dull, thrumming fear did nothing to lessen the force of the next surprise, which came when my eyes turned to the empty street some six stories down, where a lone figure was outlined in the moonlight on the sidewalk opposed to my hotel. There on the streets of Yangon stood the same hunched, six-armed creature depicted on the stupas of Piet Sehon. The details were blessedly sparse given the distance and darkness, but I could clearly see the spider-like sheen of its hairy body, and the waving mass of the stunted calicera legs around what passed for its mouth as they wriggled and twitched in the shadow. There was absolutely no way to perceive such a thing for the creature did not have eyes and distance would have obscured them even if it had, but I somehow knew beyond doubt that it was watching me. Letting the curtain fall back into place and backing away toward the bed, I began to calculate the distance the creature would have to cover to get to me through the empty hotel, pondering whether the locked doors to the stairway or the lobby would even slow it. For a horrible moment, I wondered whether it had the ability to scale the wall of the hotel and clamber through my window. Having sat down hopeless at the foot of the bed, I then heard what could best be described as an internalized whisper. Heard is not the correct way to relate it, for I don't believe it was actually a sound at all, but it is the only way I can give voice to the phenomenon. It was as if my mind processed a spoken word giving me the intimate spark of understanding one gets when they hear a familiar place name or phrase spoken aloud, but without the preceding sound being audible. Underscoring this understanding was a pain, akin to the auditory pain of a high-pitched mechanical squeal, which was so pronounced I grit my teeth and hunched over with my eyes pressed shut as if I'd been stabbed. The name I heard without hearing, understood without being told, 
was Pangku. I woke then, if that is indeed the proper word, to a knock on the door, telling me the checkout was fast approaching. The sun shone through the closed curtain's thin fabric, and my clock read ten minutes till noon. Again I had no perception of time having passed. It was as if I shut my eyes against the onslaught of that tormenting whisper which was not a whisper, and then opened them to the sound of the knocks on my door. I did feel particularly exhausted, however, so I did what I could to shake off the residual fear of so horrible an experience, and marveled at how lucid and tangible the dream seemed to have been as I gathered my things for the coming flight. I remembered the whole episode as one would remember a mugging or a tragedy, frame by frame with not a single gap in between. The recollection tormented me as I went through the time-gnawing monotony of checking bags and passing security at the airport, sat through the hours-long wait for the actual flight to commence, and boarded my initial plane. It did not truly terrify me until, after the flight to Japan and the boarding of the next plane, I drifted off to sleep somewhere over the western United States, as the final hours of that twelve-hour flight played out. It was a sizable plane, and the cabin was kept dark with most of the windows shaded, as is usual with intercontinental flights. It was easy enough to be lulled into sleep by the arduous trip and the humming of the engines. I made no conscious decision to try and rest, but rather nodded off innocuously while burning away time browsing the in-flight movie selection. When I opened my eyes, it was to near total darkness. As with my episode in the hotel, I immediately knew something was very wrong. No phones or laptops cast their bluish glow into the artificial night. No seat-mounted screens displayed flight maps or films and no bathroom indicators gleamed above the aisles, leaving the plane a pitch-dark tomb. My first reaction was to roll back the shades covering the windows, but the world beyond them was an inky black, as if a roiling liquid tar had enveloped the craft, leaving not even the wing visible. Grasping blind, I found my phone, and flipped on the flashlight to reveal that my section of coach, the farthest to the rear of the plane, was completely void of life. The hundred or so seats all seemed empty, and it was only as I stood and inched out of the aisle to better observe my surroundings that I noticed how quiet it had become. The whole craft had the hush of a cavern, my movements echoing around the empty cabin like footsteps in a cave. The thrum of the engines and the faint rattling of the luggage in the overhead bins was gone. In their place was only the sound of my nervous breathing and the rush of blood from my accelerating heart thudding in my ears. I stilled myself, suddenly nervous at the amount of noise I was making, and it was in those seconds spent trying to collect my thoughts that I heard the footsteps. Moving at a slow, dragging pace, someone was walking along the aisle farther up the length of the plane, the curtain separating coach from business class the only thing standing between me and the distant noises. Closer it came with every stifled breath and terrified heartbeat, spurring me to switch my phone off and inch with cautious dread back down the aisle toward the very rear of the craft, my hands letting the rows of seats guide me in the darkness. Once my back brushed against the wall, and I knew myself to be trapped, I inched with slow precision into the middle row of seats and crouched low. I don't know why I immediately invested the sounds with malicious intent, why I didn't call out to see if the plane had somehow stopped and been left overnight in a hangar while I dozed in the seats, but some part of me knew not to make a sound. Whoever was coming down the aisle could only be seeking one thing, and I had no intention of going quietly. When the footsteps dragging advance ceased and the slow, barely audible sound of the curtain being drawn reached my ears, I strained to perceive sounds which never came. No more footsteps were taken and no relieving voice called out to any passengers left in the cabin. Instead, there was another noise, this one even less perceptible than the curtain, and it rang with soft, determined persistence through the stilted air between me and the open passage to business class. It was a sort of fleshy, subdued cracking, the same kind of noise knuckles make when they are popped. 
It had a rattling cadence, the rapid frequency of the subdued noise reminding me of popcorn being made. This lasted for a long, long time. It is impossible to accurately guess how long, given what darkness and anticipation can do to the perception of time, but I'd wager an hour isn't far off the mark. It was still happening when, realizing I had little choice, I put together a desperate plan of escape, hoping to slip past the watching thing in the pitch-dark doorway to coach by taking the opposite aisle and making a break away up the length of the plane. Last resort was the category I'd assigned such a flippant plan to, and I set out feeling my way to the far aisle and moving in a crouch down the rows with the full expectation it would fail. Any chance was better than cowering in the darkness, hoping it went away. Whoever, perhaps whatever, allowing for that cruelly alien noise, had entered the plane, knew I was here. It knew I was somewhere out in front of it, hiding in the dark, with each desperately muffled step, each second spent praying that no misplaced footfall brought my concealment to a close. The popping, clattering noises grew more pronounced. I was close, perhaps a dozen feet away from the source of the sound with the central rows of seats between us, when the noises stopped, leaving the world in silence once more. No breath or movement disturbed the still atmosphere. All was frozen, my very heart seeming to slow down as my mind raced at breakneck speed through the reactions I could take, none of them promising. A minute seemed to pass in the suffocating dark but it might well have been much shorter. I decided to act, erring for speed now that this unseen seeker might know my position. Phone in hand, I took a deep breath and braced myself for a run, preparing for one swift motion to bring the screen to life to light my way while sprinting forward through the curtain. The light of my phone, blinding after the cavern's dark of the preceding hour, halted me mid-lunge, before me, there was no intervening curtain. Just feet away, the thing from the stupas, from the street in Yangon, crouched on many jointed legs, its many long arms splayed wide above it, braced it against the ceiling and the surrounding seats, pinning the curtain in place. Eye level with me, if eyeless things can be said to be at eye level. Its forest of calicera feelers now stood still. There was nowhere to go. I was within arm's reach, its unnatural limbs more than capable of making a grab at me. Its calicera head burst into motion, the popping resuming as they waved and danced, the soft gleam of a saw-blade circle of moistened fangs now visible behind them. Its form lurched, and from its maw slid the ichor-slickened idol of obsidian I had thrown from my window the night before, its thump upon the ground an explosion in the strangled air. My body shocked into motion by the sudden awakening of that statue's still monstrosity. I put the one weapon I had into service, hurling my phone forward at the creature's face, or at least what amounted to one. Not remaining still to see whether or not the throw connected, I spun with adrenaline-fueled flexibility into a flight back down the aisle the way I had come, hoping I could manage the task in the dark without the guiding light of the phone. Only a few steps into the retreat I was frozen in place by that familiar pain searing along the inside of my skull, just as it had in the Yangon Hotel. Again I pulled the name of that long-dead Burmese priest from the inferno of weeping synapses. Pounku, it seemed to call without speaking, again and again, my memory fading after several seconds more as I fainted or dozed off. Once again I came to my senses with no knowledge of how I had escaped that nightmare realm, sitting bolt upright in my seat as the plane juddered its landing against the runway in Washington. In a furious moment of fear, I scanned my fellow passengers and slammed open the window, ensuring that all was as it should be making certain the world beyond the prison of the plane still existed. Once the plane came to a halt, it took me a lot of milling around aimlessly considering my situation to work up the courage to file out behind the other passengers past the withdrawn dividing curtains, around which the thing had lurked. 
waiting for me in that darkened reflection of the cabin. So distraught was I after this second episode that I only realized my phone was missing when it was offered to me by one of the attendants who was prompting passengers with it as we passed off the plane. When I inquired as to where she had found it, I already knew what she would say. My stomach then sank through the floor as she produced the idol, now clean of the creature's ichor, asking if I recognized it. It is the sweetest of ironies that, after seeking the aura of fear and the unknown throughout my life with the same devotion an ascetic devotes to solitude, I was so crippled when it actually reared its fanged head to face me. That isn't lost on me, and it wasn't lost on me at the time. That irony didn't stop me from immediately plunging into the investigation once more, hindered yet simultaneously invigorated by this rupture in my strictly materialist worldview. I called contacts only to find that none had found my friend, and that little aside from a collation of the texts and notes he'd kept in his home had been done in my absence. I gathered what I could and drove into Maryland, taking the time to hike for several hours around the woods behind my friend's house to see if anything struck my eye. Had the thing from my visions prodded through his basement, where the shotgun shells had been scattered, or lurked in these trees to watch him from the woodline? Empty-handed and haunted by a yearning for sleep to which I didn't dare surrender, I decided to spend another night in his house, both to monitor his phone for any incoming calls and to try and scour the property for anything I might have missed during my initial confused evening here, poring over scribbled legendry. With coffee and the spider idol sitting on the countertop nearby keeping me alert, I called contact after contact trying to let new eyes shed light on this conundrum. Each seemed unable or unwilling to aid me in understanding my predicament, a situation I'm sure wasn't helped by my insistence on remaining vague about the cause for my alarm. I merely said that something seemingly tangible and possibly dangerous had followed my friend home from Asia, and that I had reason to believe it was now shadowing me. The monk with whom I'd spoken in Yangon seemed unwilling to return calls from my personal number, and when he realized it was me calling from my friend's number, he only reluctantly agreed to search for mention of the spider figurine, or others like it, across occult organizations in the city. It was after a full night of tearing into walls and ripping up floorboards in search of stashed arcana that I received a call on the landline the light of a new dawn peeking tentatively through the upstairs windows between the boards and curtains. The news I received stole any comfort that soft light might have offered me. Harsh and instantly recognizable, the voice from that unforgettable initial call spoke, addressing me in the tones of a physician handing out a cancer diagnosis. He told me that my time was limited and that there was no known escape from the cage in which I found myself. I asked, desperate for any information, what had become of my friend. Despite saying he did not know, he did inform me that my friend had apparently returned to Myanmar not long before I departed to search for traces of him there, and that the word around Yangon was that he had come with questions similar to mine about idols and monsters. He had set off to the north again, perhaps searching to return the idol assuring me that many had found the cursed city before, and that all had vanished, he once again hung up, and that marked the last of my conversations with Burma's otherworldly underground. It gave me more than enough to chew over, though. If my friend had arrived in one final bid to rid himself of his pursuer just hours before I had booked my own flight, and I had found nothing of him amidst the trees of Pietsehan, then he must not have found success. Saya had not known of any second trip, which raised doubts about whether he had ever arrived at his end destination in Kachin. While it was perhaps premature, I extrapolated from this that a return to the ruins was not what this thing, this not, if that's what it was, desired. I had little time to experiment before exhaustion would make my next entry into that schizoid dreamer's realm inevitable, perhaps several days. After that, 
Little nods of the head or hazy microsleeps imposed by a desperate brain might drag me off into that pitch-dark hell once more, to draw ever closer to whatever fate the creature that dwelt there had in store for me. I did not have time for excursions to the jungle. I needed to try alternative avenues of escape. The first road I attempted was perhaps the simplest. During the tired drive home to Kentucky, I made a call. A woman I had met a decade past when traveling in the American Southwest had spoken for hours with a motley group of thrill-seekers one night on many features of native superstition, a major feature of which was the destruction of idols connected with the skinwalker of a Merindian myth, which I reasoned bore some archetypal similarities to whatever force plagued me now. She instructed me on the salting and burning of artifacts a process which I had to scale up to the melting of obsidian, the minutia of which I won't get into here. While I made the rounds of my home that night, consecrating my walls using methodologies cobbled together over many years from all kinds of spiritual and occult traditions, I found the idol which had earlier that afternoon been a tiny mound of salted slag at the bottom of an old brick furnace, perfectly formed and seated upon the center of my bed my mind racing for a moment as I assured myself I was not, in that moment, asleep. This sparked a whole procession of attempts at subverting the hold the idol increasingly had on me. From locking it away in a consecrated silver box I attained while traveling in East Africa, to burying it in a grave of a rumored folk saint in Pike County, hoping the goodwill of this supposed spirit healer would nullify whatever reach the thing seemed to have. Nothing worked and with each passing hour I have grown yet more exhausted, the dancing shapes at the corners of my eyes becoming more and more akin to spiders' legs. Though I freely admit they may be the hallucinatory ramblings of a desperately sleep-starved mind, on the third day I began to catch glimpses of the spider thing walking between the trees surrounding my house. After blocking the windows, I have twice seen it lurking in my home, once appearing in the stairway behind me as I turned the corner, and again crouched in the tub of my bathroom, both times seeming to vanish the moment I felt I had truly seen it. Five days without rest have meant that even stringing this together was a task beyond measure, interrupted again and again by glances at the floor, where the shadows of great spiders scuttling between my legs showed themselves to be phantom apparitions. Worse, I now hear the thought murmurs of that wretched creature from the ruins echoing to me during my waking hours, telling me dreadful things which have solidified my resolve to do what must be done. I have gathered supplies to collapse the mouth of a mine not far from my cathedral, trapping the idol within, before rushing to my sanctuary to do what is necessary, hopefully before whatever entity controls the obsidian drops it at my feet once more. I have reason to believe that it will not be able to take me unless it manages to do so within that mirror realm to which my dreams have taken me, and if it loses its prey, the idol should well be taken back to the other side of the door, where it can do little but scratch and gnaw until another fool finds Pietsehon and slumbers in its lair. Paungku, Spinner of Dreams, was his name in life, and lest the weak-willed come knocking in his own domain, he has little sway in our world. This note, to whoever finds it, will read as the ramblings of an unstable man, which in many ways it is. Take it for exactly that, if it comforts you. But I had reason for writing it beyond explaining the thought process that led me to the tomb. If my theory proves wrong, and the obsidian idol is found with my corpse in the cathedral, then I would urge that you avoid touching it. Do what you must to clear the cathedral, but leave that thing inside. Cover over the entrance, and let the forest grow up to eat that little trail to its entrance, and forget. I cannot promise that whatever webs Pangku has spun in Myanmar cannot be woven anew here 